So hi everyone, we are here to talk about OKRs, objectives and key results. We're going to look at some of the positives, some of the real challenges they bring, and try to answer the question, are they really worth it? So there's no denying that OKRs are growing in popularity. So we see more and more organisations um, both searching on, on Google, um, but actually adopting OKRs at a, a much broader scale. And it used to be that it was just the tech companies like Google who were adopting OKRs. But actually we're finding more and more traditional businesses are now adopting them to really help to embed um, some of their agile transformations. So just based on the pure excitement of having real people in a real room, um, could we do a show of hands, cheesy show of hands, um, who has either worked with OKRs or is currently working with them? Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness, that's so much more than I thought. Okay, fantastic. Um, so there we go, uh, a proof point of that. So we're going to talk about why they're growing in popularity, but also some of the challenges, um, which I'm sure uh, you might have experienced. But firstly, just to introduce ourselves, if I'm going the right way. Um, so I'm Kim. Uh, I am the founder of Just Three Things, which is an OKR software platform. Um, but I actually built that platform when I was chief people officer for Ovo Energy, which is a, a unicorn company um, in the UK. Um, and as chief people officer, I was leading the OKR rollouts. So I've actually had um, first-hand experience of some of the challenges too. Um, and when I couldn't find a platform, I built one and then spun out. And we now actually have clients, which is so exciting, uh, one of whom is here today. Thanks, Kim. I'm Leanne, and I'm from the NatWest Group, and I work in the Enterprise Engineering team. Probably the best way to describe what we do is we're a delivery engine that supports our businesses across NatWest, such as NatWest Markets, Ulster, Commercial Retail, for example. I work alongside a lot of fantastic engineers and technical leads. I head up the performance and business management team, and I look across our people, processes, and financials. Fantastic. Thank you, Leanne. So, for the kind of one or two people in the room that didn't put their hands up um, in terms of working with OKRs, just a very brief recap. So, objectives and key results. There are goal-setting goal methodology, um, and essentially, um, objective is a statement of aspirational intent. Um, so, it's a goal, where, what do we want to do? And then key results are success criteria of that, of that goal. How will we know when we've got there? And then initiatives such as feature delivery, projects, uh, whatever, uh, however you deliver initiatives in your company, sit underneath that. So they're separated out from the OKR. And OKRs are aligned um, in a couple of ways. So first of all, they're aligned from the strategy um, all the way through to execution. So um, essentially that looks like uh, exec team, then team of teams, and then all, all, uh, department brand, and then kind of going down to the actual delivery team. So they're aligned line like that. And they're also aligned in timeframes. So typically at the more senior end of an organization, you'll have much longer term strategic OKRs and delivery will be typically quarterly OKRs. So what's the fuss about? Why, why did so many of you put your hands up? So for me, the real, um, if I had to distill the real power, power of OKRs and why I chose them at OVO, is I really wanted to cement a growth mindset. And I think why a lot of traditional organizations are turning um, to OKRs is to, um, is to try to move from fixed to growth mindset. And what do we mean by growth mindset? It's that um, a bit, at an organizational level, it's the psychological safety, it's the encouragement of teams to be empowered and to fail fast. So how do OKRs do that? The real secret is in the power of the key results. The key results are outcome-based, not output-based. And in traditional um, uh, management, and even, even have a bit safe, um, uh, teams are told, just deliver this feature. And they're told to deliver an output. And that really leaves very little room for innovation and, uh, and, and for the teams to, who are closest to the work to actually come up with, with a solution. Whereas outcomes, um, essentially by giving the team an outcome, it allows them to think about how they best might achieve that. And again, that the people doing the work are the best, the best judges of what's appropriate, not an exec sitting four or five layers up. The other real benefit for me of OKRs is alignment. So again, I, why I chose them at OVO, I had all these teams, 2,000 people, do, go off doing crazy things all over the place. And, uh, and they were all really young and enthusiastic, and it was great. Um, uh, but they really weren't aligned to the strategy. And we kept missing our numbers. And we just scratch our heads and say, oh, well, never mind. We'll move on. Um, the next quarter's another quarter. And so we needed a way of aligning what everyone was doing, both from 
uh, on the exec team um, perspective, knowing that we have the right people on the right staff, but also um, from the individual's perspective, we really wanted them to feel that they were linked to the vision and mission of the business, which is why they essentially joined in the first place. So I'll hand you over to Leanne, who can talk about some of the um, advantages in NatWest Group. Thank you. Um, I wanted to share some of the reasons why we chose OKRs and some of the benefits that we've seen in the last 18 months since adopting them in enterprise engineering. Um, we started using OKRs because we really wanted to demonstrate and articulate our value to our end customer. We're an internal delivery function, and so it's key we can link, we can link between what we're doing and the value we're creating to our customers. It's key for our team's motivation as well as our stakeholders. 18 months in, we recently conducted lots of interviews across the teams to see what they thought the benefits of using OKRs were, and that's what I wanted to just share with you today. So I love this quote, actually, um, and I think it says it all. Finally, I know why I'm doing what I am doing. Um, this actually came from one of our more junior users who struggled to really understand the work or the why of the work that she was doing. In my own team, I find OKRs really impactful. Um, they're a really useful tool to be able to ask questions. The so what? Why are we doing this? And who actually really cares? And it stopped us on quite a number of occasions doing work just for the sake of doing it when we've not been able to really explain that value. Understanding the why um, is key to our team's motivation but also for us on the leadership team um, to understand how the team's work aligns to our top um, level OKRs and our company strategy. So OKRs are really helping us to drive the conversation between enterprise engineering and the customer and our teams and individuals. We discuss what's going well and we can look at what needs focus and where there are potential blockers. We also use OKRs in our town halls to communicate to the whole department how we're doing against those top level OKRs so that everybody's on the same page. Using an OKR tool means that for the first time, our team's work isn't just hidden away in somewhere like JIRA, for example. Everyone has full transparency. This means that the platforms and teams can collaborate without always the need for leadership team involvement. So we update our key results once a month in our team meetings and it's really motivational for our teams to see the difference that their work is having. I personally really like seeing that dial move. It keeps the momentum going rather than just setting a set of goals and never looking at them again, like with some other methodologies. Our teams tell us that OKRs are easy to use and easy to understand. Okay, so we should probably just finish there and leave you all with a brilliant rosy picture of OKRs. Um, but of course, as probably most of you in the room know, um, they come with some really big challenges. So the first one for me, and I'm running the risk now of insulting most people here who might have written books, um, the biggest problem with OKRs is the number of books about them, <laughs> in my opinion. And it's so easy to get bogged down in the doctrine, and it's almost like a religion. And the, you know, the confirmed OKRs, aspirational OKRs, 70%, there's so much extra information that actually it prevents that simple implementation. And the best implementations I've seen of OKRs is where people just keep it super, super, super simple. If you don't have the psychological safety in the business, um, then essentially having transparency can feel really daunting for people um, and it can feel a little bit like you're being checked up on. So I originally built Just These Things um, uh, Ovo and it was called Cadence um, and we let teams have as many OKRs as they liked and we found the average number was 10. 10 OKRs to deliver in a quarter. Um, so, uh, again, what I see all the time is that lack of focus. So, um, obviously, now we uh, limit people to three priorities um, because it's really important for the alignment to understand the priorities of each team. And again, a classic mistake that I made many times, um, uh, translating our roadmap directly into an OKR. So just taking the things to deliver on the roadmap and saying, these are the key results, um, and then I'll make up a name at the top, um, rather than uh, thinking about the actual uh, metric key result being an outcome. 
And finally, um, thinking through how the governance might change. Um, so at OVO, we put the OKRs in, and I went to an exec meeting, and uh, the CEO starts off with the round robin of death, where he says, right, marketing, what's your update? OK, HR, what's your update? And it kind of defeats the whole object of having shared goals that are outcome-based and they're customer-based. And uh, so really thinking about the governance and how that needs to change, the reporting, the meeting structures, and so forth, is really, really important. So, two years ago when I was asked to look at OKRs, I literally thought, how hard can this be? I just need to pull together a set of metrics. And I still laugh now because how naive was that? <laughs> Little did I know that I was actually embarking on a, a mindset change programme. Again, using the information from our recent interviews, um, I just wanted to share with you some of those challenges we've faced. So we're still not using OKRs to have the conversations I'd really like us to have with our end customers. Sometimes we are still missing the so what. What, what does our work actually mean to the customer? We also under, underestimated the training requirements. So whilst we did do lots of training for our teams, it really does need that continuous focus and for that knowledge to be refreshed. Obviously, we have leavers, we have people join, and then there are people who just couldn't make a particular training session at a given point in time. We've focused a lot on our customer delivery, but what we really need to focus more on is our cultural and behavioural change, or things that don't necessarily or typically align to customer delivery. So people are our biggest asset, and so we need to ensure the focus and is there and is visible. This is another quote I really like from one of our senior platform leads and actually is typical of the feedback we received. There's still a desire to be seen to be green and great. So OKRs are motivational and fantastic when they're green, but what happens when they're red? So whilst it's, whilst it's great to see the alignment of team OKRs with enterprise engineering um, ones, there's still quite a lot of siloed mentality. Different teams don't always share the same OKRs and have their own set. For me, that's really a missed opportunity for us to come together to showcase the value that we can bring for our customers. And measuring key results is so hard. <laughs> the amount of times that we've came up with key results and then when we've come to do our check-in, we've not been able to update them because we just don't have the data available. So whilst it's great to come up with a really strong key result if, as a success criteria, if we don't have the data or a way to measure them, it's completely pointless. And it can just feel like another thing to do. What I'm really keen to make sure is that it's not seen as another tick box exercise. We have lots of company asks, we have KPI reporting, and sometimes the teams do feel as if it is just another thing that they have to do. So, key takeaways. I think for me, OKRs, um, they, they're, they're just a goal methodology. They're not um, a, a change programme. So before I was uh, over, I spent seven years as an occupational psychologist leading change programmes from a psychology perspective. And um, OKRs will not create a, a, a culture of empowerment or psychological safety. And I think that's a really important, so in, in answering the question, are they worth it? They're definitely not worth it if that's, that's, the, that's the outcome and the, there's no other work um, uh, being done. But I have seen really, really excellent implementations where they've really almost had that practical embedding of the, um, the intention to move to a growth mindset. So it's a way of practically demonstrating to your people that, yes, this is, what we're, this is the direction we're moving in and this is the intention and wherever possible we're going to empower you. So some of my um, key takeaways for anyone that is um, uh, embarking in OKR programs, um, I think if I had to pick out one, I would just say just keep it simple. Um, so almost for, try to forget the doctrine, try to um, uh, forget the books you might have read, um, and try to keep it as simple as possible. So to answer the question, are OKRs worth it? In my opinion, they definitely are. The alignment, focus, and transparency that they, uh, they bring is definitely worth the pain. But my top three takeaways are: <laughs> firstly, make the most of your uh, make the most of your champions and early adopters. 
we've got some great platform leads who have really bought into OKRs and have been amazing advocates. Using these champions is really powerful because it's not just a centralised team selling the dream of OKRs, it's people whom they can relate to. Secondly, get help, literally. When I started this whole initiative, it really was side of a desk, as Kim, as Kim knows only too well. And that was the case actually up until very recently. So what I would say is if you're really serious about adopting OKRs, then ask for that resource help early. And lastly, we had lots of questions around what the difference was between individual um, or personal goals and OKRs. So I created this Venn diagram to try and explain simply the difference. And you, I won't go into all the detail, but you can see there we've got the team versus individual goals. And where we do have some overlap, it's where you're personally contributing to the team's OKRs. And I thought that was probably the most simple way to try and explain that. Fantastic. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Um, in terms of call to action, um, uh, if you want to hear more from Leanne and from uh, her peers, um, uh, then you're all very welcome to join our OKR Council, which is um, run by Jonathan Smart, who hopefully you've probably all got it, picked up a book at the door. Um, it's once a quarter, and essentially it's Chatham House rules, um, no software selling, I promise, um, and essentially peer-to-peer -peer conversation around um, some of the challenges with OKRs. Thank you very much.